Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to our annual lecture, particularly important for those of us in Apex Scotland because this is our 30th anniversary. I can remember as a very young social work manager in the 80s being around in uh, Central Regional Council when Jean Freeman came forward with proposals and ideas for an employability program for those who offended or are at risk of offending. It seems a very long time ago now, and I suppose it is. Since our early beginnings as the first specialist offender employability charity in Scotland, we have seen countless changes, and we as an organisation have had to adapt to variations in political and social thinking, as well as economic climates. When you think when Apex first started, there was no Scottish Parliament, for example. There were the regional councils delivering uh, social work justice services. The SPS looked very different, and certainly so did Police Scotland. But throughout that time, Apex has looked to work with our colleagues in government and local government throughout the public sector and the third sector to improve the life chances of our client group. We seek to build stronger, more resilient, and safer communities, and to contribute to the overall strategic targets of reducing offending and reoffending through making possible a more positive future for those drawn into the justice system. In recent years, we have become increasingly committed to models which engage people at the earliest possible stage, including working within schools, developing diversion schemes, setting up social enterprises to bridge the gap into regular employment, or providing skills-based training and accredited qualifications. You will have the chance to see some examples of these after the lecture during the reception, so please take every opportunity to meet with our staff at the stalls or tables through in the reception area after the lecture. <coughs> Each year we try and invite someone to give our annual lecture who we believe can add something fresh to our thinking about practice issues, about policy issues, any areas to help move things forward towards a fairer and more modern justice uh, system in Scotland. Now this year I am delighted to introduce the Right Honourable John James Wolfe QC. Lord Wolfe became an advocate in 1992 and was first standing junior counsel to the Scottish Ministers from 2002 to 2007. The same year he was appointed Queen's Counsel. From 2007 to 2010 he served as advocate deputy called to the Bar of England and Wales in 2013. James Wolfe was elected Dean of the Faculty of Advocates in 2014. He was appointed Lord Advocate on the 1st of June 2016. We know that the Lord Advocate is the Senior Law Officer of the Scottish Government and is the Head of System of Prosecution and Investigation of Deaths in Scotland. The subject he's chosen tonight is prosecution in the public interest. And it comes at a time of reform and change across the whole of the justice sector. It means the tensions between government strategy, public opinion, and effective but fair and proportionate response to offending have rarely been more acute. How does a reformist agenda designed to reduce offending and limit the damage caused by some responses to it sit alongside the role of the Crown Prosecution Service? I'm I'm sure you will find much of interest, and of course, as always, there will be time for questions at the end. James Wolfe advises me he will be talking for about 30 minutes, and that will allow us probably 20 minutes at least to have some questions at the end. There's always a thing about questions at the Apex Lecture. Everybody's always got lots and lots, just at the time I'm wanting to finish off and let you all into the reception. So I'd, I'd really be pleased if you could prepare your questions and get ready to go as soon as we get to that stage. Without further ado, I will hand over to our speaker for tonight, Lord Advocate James Wolfe. Uh, thank you, Brian. And, um, let me congratulate Apex Scotland on its 30th birthday. Um, 
I'm very pleased to see that the subject of prosecution seems to have attracted such public interest, even if not in the front row. Um, it's not in a spirit of competition with Apex Scotland that I mentioned that um, it is 430 years uh, since the Lord Advocate was uh, granted the title by the Scottish Parliament of 1587 to prosecute any crime uh, in Scotland. Uh, the Act which uh, did that uh, essentially established the Lord Advocate as the public prosecutor. And it might therefore be said, if at the risk of some oversimplification, that my predecessors and I have together accumulated 430 years of experience prosecuting in the public interest. Uh, I'm grateful to Apex Scotland for inviting me to give this lecture on that uh, topic, on the topic of prosecution in the public interest. Uh, preparing it has given me the opportunity to reflect on certain basic features of our system of prosecution in Scotland and to think about other systems uh, elsewhere in Europe. Um, my purpose tonight is essentially descriptive to explain some of the basic features of the system which we enjoy and to describe uh, how prosecutors go about uh, a, a fundamental part of their task. Uh, my starting point is that the effective, rigorous, fair and independent investigation and prosecution of crime satisfies some of the basic responsibilities of the state. It vindicates the interests of the community at large in the enforcement of the criminal law. It fulfills the state's responsibility to establish mechanisms which seek to protect individuals and communities from crime. It meets the expectations of victims of crime that the state will respond to the injustice done to them. And at the same time, it provides assurance that prosecutorial action will be taken only where, where there is a proper basis uh, for doing so. A an effective, rigorous and fair prosecution service acting independently in the public interest is accordingly a central component in a criminal justice system which aims to deal fairly with persons who are suspected and accused of crime, to respond effectively and proportionately to offending behaviour, to secure justice for the victims of crime and to punish people who are convicted of crime. I was pleased that following its inquiry into the role and purpose of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service earlier this year, the Justice Committee of the Scottish Parliament agreed that the service is overall effective, rigorous, fair and independent in the prosecution of crime. Uh, that is a tribute to the skilled and dedicated staff of the service whom it is my privilege uh, to lead. It is individual prosecutors and the staff who support them who day in and day out across Scotland make real the commitment of the service uh, which I had to serve the public interest in the effective enforcement of the criminal law. Uh, Lord Hope has described our system uh, in this way. The entire system for the investigation and prosecution of crime in Scotland is in the hands of the public prosecutor. Overall responsibility for the investigation and prosecution of crime rests with the Lord Advocate. He presides over a system which is operated on his behalf in the Sheriff and District Courts by the Procurator Fiscal. The functions and powers of the Procurator Fiscal long predated the inception of police forces in Scotland. So while there is a close working relationship between the prosecutor and the police, the police remain subject to the control of the Procurator Fiscal. Let me draw your attention to some fundamental features of the system which Lord Hope described. Uh, the first is that in Scotland we have a unified public prosecution system. It includes advocate deputies, procurators fiscal and their deputies and all the staff of, Crown, of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, but they operate within a single system which deals with all crime subject to the jurisdiction of the Scottish Courts. And no public authority outside that system has title to prosecute crime uh, in our courts. Uh, the Dutch call this the monopoly principle, the principle that there should be a single public prosecution authority responsible for the prosecution of all crime. Uh, 
and in Scotland that principle is modified only by the continuing competence of private prosecution, which are in our system extremely rare. A private prosecution may be brought only with the consent of the Lord Advocate or the approval of the court, and the court's approval will be granted only in exceptional circumstances. And so for practical purposes, the prosecution of all crime in Scotland is in the hands of a single public prosecution system. The second feature of the system which Lord Hope described is the role of the prosecutor in relation to the investigation of crime. Lord Gill summarised this in the following terms. In the Scottish system of criminal investigation, the procurator fiscal directs the investigation and not the police. In the early stages of an investigation, the police almost always act on their own initiative, but it is their duty to report uh, on their investigation to the procurator fiscal and to act upon his further instructions. And that principle is reflected in the statutory regime under which Police Scotland uh, operates. Prosecutors, of course, rely heavily on the professional skill of the police in the investigation of crime, but the legal regime which I've described underpins the working arrangements under which police and prosecutors together seek to address criminality in Scotland. As many of you will know, the two features of our system which I've just described contrast with the position in England and Wales but they reflect the European norm as I understand it. In particular, although the details may vary, in the major continental systems, the investigation of crime by the police is, as in our system, generally subject to direction by the prosecutor. And these are features of our system which facilitate a coherent approach to the investigation and, pros and prosecution of crime, both horizontally across all types of criminality and vertically at different stages of the system. Uh, a third feature of the system to which Lord Hope referred is the overall responsibility for the system which rests with the Lord Advocate. The functions which as Lord Advocate I exercise as head of that system are known as retained functions. They're functions which were exercised by the Lord Advocate uh, long before devolution and which have been retained by the Lord Advocate since devolution. And I'm required by the Scotland Act to exercise those functions independently of any other person. And that's a statutory requirement which in any event reflects sound and well-established constitutional principle. Uh, I hope that the principle of prosecutorial independence uh, goes without saying. Uh, but as the Solicitor General for Scotland sometimes says, um, it's sometimes worth saying the things which go without saying. Uh, few things are more serious for the individual than to be charged by the state with a crime. And few things are more important to society than the effective enforcement of the criminal law. As the Appeal Court has recently observed, it is important in the public interest that prosecutors exercise their judgment independently, robustly, forensically, and objectively on the whole evidence available. Uh, regardless of the public attention which a case may excite, prosecutors must not be influenced in their decision making, whether in relation to the investigation or the prosecution of crime by extraneous and irrelevant considerations. Like judges, prosecutors must decide without fear or favour, affection or ill will, uh, objectively and professionally on the basis of an assessment of the evidence. And it is one of my constitutional responsibilities to promote the integrity and independence of prosecutorial decision making. The statutory function to exercise my retained functions independently of any other person applies equally to the formation of prosecution policy. That does not mean, of course, that I should ignore broader considerations of criminal justice policy. Uh, many of the criminal justice systems of which I'm aware have mechanisms whereby the prosecution of crime may be aligned with the relevant national criminal justice policy, and that's appropriate and sensible. Criminal justice policy is, after all, the policy of the democratically accountable government, and in our system, that is a government of which I'm a member. But the question of how that policy should be reflected in prosecution policy is in our system uh, a matter for me as Lord Advocate. Uh, the principle of prosecutorial independence does not prevent prosecutors from contributing to the development and implementation of an effective criminal justice policy. 
or indeed to the maintenance and reform of an effective and fair criminal justice system. That may be illustrated by my own participation in the Scottish Government's Serious and Organised Crime Task Force, or the Crown Agent's role in the Justice Board, and by the participation and contribution of the service in a variety of policy initiatives, uh, such as the SCTS Evidence and Procedure Review. Our interest as prosecutors in contributing to the wider public good is reflected too in initiatives such as the Solicitor General's Education Summit on Sexual Offending by and Against Children and Young People, which will take place next week. Uh, nor, for that matter, does the principle of prosecutorial independence uh, sit incompatibly with appropriate mechanisms of accountability. Every decision to prosecute is tested in court, and the conduct of prosecutors in court is subject to judicial and public scrutiny. And under the Victims and Witnesses Scotland Act of 2014, victims of crime have the right of a decision not to prosecute reviewed in accordance with guidelines made under the Act. And I'm, of course, accountable through the normal processes of parliamentary scrutiny for my oversight of the system, as we've seen in the past year in the Justice Committee inquiry. But let me turn from structural matters to prosecutorial decision making. Uh, when the Procurator Fiscal receives a report from the police or from another reporting agency, the Fiscal may instruct or undertake further investigation. But once the investigation is complete, the Prosecutor must decide what to do with the case. And I want to say something about the role which public interest considerations may have in decision making and in, about the options for prosecutorial action which are available. But the first question which the prosecutor must address is whether or not there is sufficient admissible evidence to justify commencing proceedings. Uh, in assessing whether there is sufficient evidence, prosecutors may properly take into account concerns about the quality of the evidence, the reliability and credibility of the evidence. If but only if the prosecutor is satisfied that there is sufficient admissible, credible and reliable evidence that a crime has been committed by the accused, the prosecutor must go on to consider what action is in the public interest. The prosecution code sets out factors which may, depending on the circumstances of the particular case, be relevant in determining what action it is in the public interest. These include, among other things, the nature and gravity of the offence, the impact of the offence on victims and witnesses, the age, background and circumstances of the accused, the attitude of the victim, the motive for the crime and the risk of further offending. And the weight to be attached to any particular consideration will depend, of course, on the circumstances. In many cases, where there is sufficient evidence to justify proceedings, a prosecution will be appropriate, and, that event, and in that event the prosecutor will commence and pursue proceedings in the appropriate forum. Uh, the Prosecution Code articulates a general rule that cases should be taken in the lowest competent court unless there is some good reason to the contrary. And that proposition reflects an underlying principle that the response of the criminal justice system should be proportionate. It invites the prosecutor to focus on the likely outcome of the case, and the Crown is engaged in a review of prosecution policy which seeks to implement that policy more systematically on the basis of the sentencing practice of the courts. But our system recognises that the effective enforcement of the criminal law does not always require criminal proceedings. The Prosecution Code recognises that prosecutors have other options, in particular the use of direct measures and diversion, which in particular circumstances, and especially in relation to less ser serious offending behaviour, may effectively and proportionately reflect the public interest. And in the context of a lecture sponsored by Apex Scotland, it's appropriate that I say a little more about these. First of all, diversion. A diversion in the context of a prosecutorial decision uh, involves the referral of the accused for support, treatment, or other action. From a prosecutorial perspective, the suitability of a case for diversion is likely to depend on the nature and gravity of the offence and an assessment of whether in the particular circumstances, both of the case and of the accused, the accused offending can appropriately and effectively be addressed 
by a diversionary measure, and in particular whether the diversion opportunity is likely to prevent or deter the accused from committing further offences. It goes without saying that whether a case which is otherwise suitable for diversion can be marked for a diversion by the prosecutor depends on the availability of an appropriate and effective scheme in the relevant locality. And it follows that the use of diversion by prosecutors is constrained by the availability of appropriate and effective schemes. And it also follows that the ability of prosecutors to use diversion as a prosecutorial response consistently is constrained by the diversity of provision in different parts of the country. Uh, the new community justice regime provides an opportunity for enhancing the availability of appropriate and effective diversion schemes across the country, and prosecutors are working with community justice partners both nationally and locally. Uh, in that regard. Let me turn to direct measures. The prosecutor may issue a written or face-to-face -face warning, uh, or the prosecutor may offer the accused one of the disposals provided for uh, uh, as direct measures under the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act, and there are four of these. Uh, first, uh, a fixed penalty, so-called fiscal fine, the maximum amount of which was fixed in 2008 at 300 pounds. Uh, secondly, a payment of compensation to the victim of up to 5,000 pounds. Thirdly, a combined fixed penalty and compensation. And fourthly, a work offer, which offers the alleged offender the opportunity of performing between 10 and 50 hours of unpaid work. Uh, a direct measure faces the accused up with the consequences of offending uh, more swiftly than court proceedings. It secures early resolution for the victim. A successful direct measure necessarily avoids victims and witnesses being required to attend at court. Uh, at the same time, a direct measure is not a conviction, and the range of disposals available di by direct measure is more limited than those available on conviction. There may be good reasons in relation to particular offending behaviour or in particular circumstances for taking the view that a conviction is the outcome which the public interest demands. But used appropriately, direct measures may represent an effective and proportionate prosecutorial uh, response. The various features of our system which I've just been describing may usefully be seen in a wider European context. Prosecution systems internationally fall into two broad camps. Uh, some jurisdictions start from the proposition that there's, if there is sufficient evidence to justify a prosecution, the prosecutor is obliged to initiate proceedings uh, in court. Uh, Germany is perhaps the leading example of such a system, but others have the same starting point. Uh, other jurisdictions, including France, the Netherlands, and England and Wales, take a different approach. These systems, like our own, recognize that the public interest in prosecuting an alleged crime to trial may be outweighed in particular circumstances by other considerations. And these systems accordingly proceed on the basis that prosecutors are not obliged to initiate criminal proceedings in every case where there is sufficient evidence uh, to do so. Uh, in fact, this historic divide between two broad types of prosecutorial system today no longer reflects uh, the reality, at least in Europe. European criminal justice systems, including those which started from a position of mandatory prosecution, have in recent decades adopted various alternative mechanisms for disposing of cases. So, for example, in Germany, prosecutors no longer proceed on the basis that every crime must be prosecuted to trial, or indeed at all. German prosecutors have been given the power to dismiss minor cases where the guilt of the accused is minimal, and there is no public interest in prosecution. They've been given the power to dismiss lower-level cases on condition that the accused agrees to pay a fine, perform community service, compensate the victim, or assume other related responsibilities, a suite of powers which looks very like our own direct measures. And they may, in cases where the potential sentence does not exceed one year's imprisonment, propose a coercive order 
which unless the accused objects may be approved by the judge without a trial and which indeed if it is approved counts uh, as a conviction. And looking across a number of European jurisdictions, one now finds a variety of regimes for the conditional disposal of cases, where the prosecutor may halt proceedings or decide not to initiate proceedings on condition that the accused accepts and complies with certain conditions, as well as regimes which allow prosecutors to impose sanctions either at their own hand or with the approval of the court. And even in England and Wales, which until recently stood markedly apart from this trend, now has statutory provisions allowing for the administration of a conditional uh, caution. And the conclusion which I draw is that in giving prosecutors a range of potential actions, in addition to the initiation of criminal proceedings, a range of actions which enable prosecutors to seek to achieve an appropriate, effective and proportionate prosecutorial response to offending behaviour. Uh, we sit firmly within the European uh, mainstream. Uh, before I close, there are two matters upon which I uh, would like to uh, say a little more. Uh, the first is the role and nature of discretion in prosecutorial decision making. I prefer myself to speak of professional prosecutorial judgment. Uh, when prosecutors apply the evidential test, the question, and ask themselves whether there is sufficient evidence, they do not exercise discretion. Rather, they exercise professional skill in assessing the evidence in light of the relevant law. That may not be an easy exercise, and reasonable professionals may sometimes disagree, but there is no discretionary aspect uh, to it. Uh, if there is a sufficient evidence, then there is a prosecutorial decision which falls to be made, and it's here that it may be said the prosecutor exercises a discretion or has a judgment to make as to what prosecutorial action is appropriate in the public interest. But that's not a judgment which falls to be made in a vacuum. Uh, I was um, struck, slightly startled to read in a study of the French criminal justice system published in 2005, a quotation from a magistrat saying, I'm not at all tolerant of sexual offences, but I have a colleague who doesn't give a damn. And a quotation from a French police officer saying the policies or decisions of certain magistrates are in identical circumstances but in different places, quite different. Uh, for my own part, uh, I would not regard it to be desirable in a national prosecution service uh, for materially different approaches to similar offending to be taken without good reason. Uh, I rely, of course, on pr prosecutors to exercise their professional prosecutorial judgment in the cases before them, and I trust them to do that. Uh, there's no substitute for a close attention to the evidence in the individual case and the application of professional judgment to the circumstances. The prosecutors exercise that judgment within a framework which today seeks to achieve a reasonable consistency of approach across the system. And I go back to the point I made earlier about the ability of our system to secure a coherence of approach uh, across uh, all uh, types of criminality. And we do that through guidance which seeks to structure decision making and through institutional mechanisms such as the establishment of specialist units to deal with particular categories of offending. The second matter upon which I would like to touch is the position of victims of crime. Uh, the prosecution of crime is undertaken by a public prosecutor who acts independently in the public interest. The prosecutor is not the victim's lawyer. Uh, that does not, of course, mean that as prosecutors we can or should ignore the interests of victims, either generally or in the context of individual cases. The interests of the victim are one aspect of the public interest which, depending on the circumstances, falls to be taken into account in deciding what prosecutorial action uh, to take. One of the purposes of the criminal justice system, uh, even if it is not by any means the sole purpose, is to address the injustice which has been done to the victim. And here too there is a European context. The Victims and Witnesses Act 2014, which sets the current legal framework 
uh, implemented the EU Victims uh, Rights Directive. And that legislation followed from the remarkable shift in our understanding of the needs and rights of victims of crime uh, since the beginning of this uh, century. Uh, as public prosecutors, we can only fulfill our public responsibilities if victims and witnesses generally have the confidence to come forward and to speak up, and if their voices are effectively heard in the trial process. process. And these things are plainly in the public interest. Uh, and the support which the service provides to victims is entirely compatible with the exercise by prosecutors of independent professional uh, judgment. I return to my starting point, the significance to a just and successful society of the effective, rigorous, fair prosecution of crime by a prosecutor acting independently in the public interest. That is not an end in itself. It is one of the means for promoting the safety of individuals and communities and for securing uh, justice. In a society governed by the rule of law, it underpins our freedom and security. But the Scottish Government Vision and Priorities document published earlier this year reported that Scotland has become a safer place and that people feel safer in their communities. It stated that public confidence in the system is relatively high. For my part, I believe that Scotland's prosecutors have contributed in no small part to those outcomes and they will continue to do so, perhaps, perhaps indeed for another 430 years. Thank you very much. Thanks to the Lord Advocate for that. We'll have an opportunity to say thanks properly in a minute, but um, he's now going to take some questions. So we've got roving mics. Can I ask you to say, identify yourself, say who you are and where you're from. On my right, we've got Vary with a mic and uh, Karen on the left. So could I invite the first question, please? Vary. Stuart Stevenson, MSP, and a member of the Justice Committee in the Parliament who's been working uh, with the Lord Advocate recently. Um, I just want to look at the position of victims. Uh, right at the end of your uh, contribution, Lord Advocate, you said the uh, prosecutor is not the victim's lawyer. You talked about victim support. Uh, you also earlier talked about uh, considering the attitude of the victim and in direct measures early resolution being helpful to the victim. But I suppose for many victims it kind of boils down to, well, they're getting support, you're not their lawyer, who do they think is on their side when it's prosecution uh, of uh, the person who's perpetrated the crime against uh, the, the, the victim? Uh, Yes, th 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 thank you very much. I mean, I, I would um, uh, I would certainly hope that victims uh, of crime um, uh, understand and feel that the prosecutor is on their side, even though the prosecutor is, is not the victim's lawyer, and prosecutors have to make dispassionate decisions based on the evidence and based on the uh, 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 public interest. Um, the the um, attitude of the victim to um, the offence, uh, the attitude of the victim to a prosecution, um, uh, these are considerations which, depending on all the circumstances, may be relevant to a prosecutor in deciding um, what prosecutorial action uh, to, uh, uh, to take. Um, and um, the service um, has, um, since the start of this century, um, uh, sought to provide appropriate support to victims uh, through the process. Now, we know that there's um, 
uh, from the Thompson Review, uh, the review carried out by the previous Solicitor General and published last year by the service, that there is much more that the system uh, could and should do in order to provide support to victims. As prosecutors, um, we can provide certain types of support. Uh, there are other types of support which others um, in the justice system will have to uh, address. And the Thompson Review was a, a, a useful um, a, a, a useful and important review which I, I hope will prompt um, debate uh, about the way the system as a whole responds to the needs of victims. Of course, the other aspect of um, uh, the interaction of victims with the system is um, the process of giving evidence and we're, uh, um, we've become much more uh, sensitive across the system and have introduced mechanisms so that the giving of evidence for vulnerable witnesses generally, and in particular victims of crime, um, is uh, um, uh, made, uh, facilitated uh, and um, uh, the programme for government of the Scottish Government published today uh, announced uh, the uh, anticipated further measures uh, in that regard. So we've undergone a sea change in our approach to the role of victims. We recognise that they should be supported through the system. Um, the prosecution of crime is an important, you know, one of the purposes of the prosecution of crime is the vindication of the injustice done to victims. It's an important part of the public interest. It doesn't exhaust the public interest. Good evening, I'm Maggie Mellon and I'm a citizen. And thank you very much for your contribution on what's, I think, a really interesting topic. I've recently been part of a, an initiative which was going into courts to see how it was that Scotland has got the highest rate of imprisonment of women. We've actually got one of the highest rates of imprisonment of everybody. So, but one of the things that struck me that isn't talked about is that, or struck everybody that goes in, is that most of the people in the courts that are prosecuted are poor. So my question really is, in terms of the public interest, why should that be the case? And is it in the public interest that so much money is spent on prosecuting and imprisoning people who have generally had suffered a lot of adversity and when you see them in the court and in the dock, they're clearly suffering from mental, social, financial and all sorts of other adversities. So I just wonder if you could say a bit about how we have, why we're in this position. Yes, I think I, uh, perhaps rather than wh why we're in this position, I, I, I could um, make this point that um, the, um, uh, uh, the disproportionate impact of crime in our less advantaged communities is a feature of our society. Um, the um, dealing effectively with criminality in our less advantaged communities is therefore an important aspect of the public interest. Um, I, I, one of the things that I um, I hope uh, has come came, came uh, across from my lecture was the interest which we as prosecutors have in effective responses in the public interest. Um, we are interested in the use of um, diversion where that is available. We are interested in the use of direct measures um, where that uh, where where. Um, these alternatives are effective and appropriate uh, and proportionate responses to the particular offending behaviour. Um, the question of how we deal with uh, men, uh, individuals suffering from mental health in the criminal justice system is uh, you know, a, larger, uh, a larger issue and um, uh, as prosecutors um, equally, uh, it is important that um, we have uh, good and reliable information uh, about the mental health status of individuals who come into contact with the criminal justice system so that uh, prosecutors can take um, effective and appropriate um, decisions reflecting the public interest but reflecting the public interest including uh, the particular um, characteristics of the uh, accused uh, as well as um, the other features of the public interest to which I referred earlier. Thank you. David? Thank you. 
David Strang, Chief Inspector of Prisons for Scotland. Thank you. David Strang, uh, Chief Inspector of Prisons for Scotland, thank you very much for your, for your lecture this evening. Um, this afternoon, the First Minister announced um, that the government intends to bring forward legislation to extend the presumption against short prison sentences from three months to 12 months, which uh, I welcome warmly. Um, you said that the court's sentencing practice had an impact on prosecutorial prosec um, um, decision making. Thank you. Um, so I, just, I wanted to ask you what you thought the impact of um, of the change, uh, if that is legislated for through Parliament, I was thinking particularly whether you saw an extension of direct measures, uh, perhaps building on on Maggie's question, uh, for particularly people with um, drug and alcohol problems, mental health problems. Uh, what do you think the impact of the change will be on uh, fiscal decisions? Yes. No. Well, thank you very much. And and um, the the thrust of criminal justice policy reflected in the programme for government today. Um, you know, very much aligns with the, um, uh, um, well, uh, uh, aligns and builds on the proposition that um, effective and early interventions other than imprisonment um, may well be um, the, um, the most effective way of, of um, dealing with, uh, uh, w w w with crime. Um, it'd be, I think, premature for me to predict precisely how that will play out and what impact it will have on prosecutorial decision making. Um, courts will continue to have a range of options available to them, some of which are not available through direct measures. Um, uh, and the presumption is, of course, a presumption, so there will still be, um, uh, 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 as I understand it, some scope for uh, the use of uh, uh, e even short sentences. Um, the point that you make, though, is a, is a, is a valid one, that it aligns with the idea that um, an effective criminal justice response is not necessarily always the initiation of proceedings. Um, and in our practice, um, through the use of diversion where that's available, through the use of direct measures, uh, we seek to secure an effective and proportionate response to the particular offending behavior and the particular accused with whom uh, we're dealing. Um, as I say, premature to anticipate just how the change in sentencing policy will feed through, but it's certainly something that we'll be uh, keeping an eye on. Can I just jump on there? Just turn a bit further. Yes, hello, uh, John Friary uh, from All Clean Up Scotland, part of the Apex Group. I just wonder if you um, think, as I do, that there's a widening gap between the more enlightened and flexible prosecution outcomes that you suggested in your lecture, as against the sort of public media slash social media um, view of the world, which seems to be ever increasingly uh, sort of punishment-led, uh, retribution-led, rather than rehabilitation. And have we got what role can we have in trying to bridge that if it's in fact bridgeable? Well, I think it's very important that we consistently keep our mind, keep our eye on what is an effective and proportionate response. Um, and in the context of prosecutorial decision making, it's um, uh, hugely important that prosecutors uh, apply their uh, minds objectively apply their judgment and their skill professionally, independently, regardless of. Uh, any extraneous considerations um, and consider um, whether or not there's sufficient evidence to justify proceedings and if there is, uh, what is the appropriate action in the public interest, bearing in mind all the considerations that I mentioned earlier. Are you just... Uh um, Nancy Lauks from Families Outside and the Centre for Law, Crime and Justice at the University of Strathclyde. Um, I just want to ask what you think, what role you think the prosecution can or should have in relation to um, or taking into account the likely impact of prosecution and punishment on children and families of people who are going through the justice system um, when they obviously haven't committed the offence themselves but are likely to suffer the consequences. 
I mean, I think there's perhaps a broader, a broader question about how the criminal justice system t you know, takes, takes cognizance of the impact on the family of the accused. Um, um, I, I, I don't have a particular um, response in relation to um, the um, you know, a, a, any particular initiative that a, the prosecution might take. If prosecutors are aware of all the circumstances, then they are best equipped to make um, effective and appropriate decisions in the public interest. And I certainly wouldn't want to exclude um, the family circumstances of an accused being, uh, at least in some circumstances, a potentially relevant um, consideration. Lord Advocate, Rose Fitzpatrick, Deputy Chief Constable, Police Scotland. You spoke about the confidence of victims of crime, and you also mentioned that recent reporting is that public confidence in the justice system itself is high. I wondered whether you had a view as to whether the public interest is always the same as public confidence. Um, It seems to me that it is um, strongly in the public interest that there should be public confidence in our justice system and in all the institutions which go to make up the justice system. If the public has confidence that um, the justice system will respond appropriately, effectively, proportionately, then it seems to me that is a good thing in the public interest. Um, of course, we, we make decisions um, um, uh, not directly in order to uh, instill confidence. We instill confidence by the integrity, independence, and um, commitment that we bring to the work that we do as uh, an agency involved in the criminal justice system. So you know, it's the integrity and independence of what we do um, and the consistency and effectiveness of what we do that ought to instill public confidence. I um, don't know if that quite answers your question, but um, uh, there, is a, there is a link um, um, between what we do and public confidence, of course, and public confidence, it seems to me, is important because if people lose confidence in the justice system, then um, the... Um, uh, stability um, uh, of um, society may start, you know, starts to unravel. Karen, halfway down on the right, please. On your right. Lord Advocate Kevin Drummond, retired sheriff. Lord Advocate, you rightly stressed the importance of uh, an independent prosecution service. I think I noted you accurately when you then said, prosecution policy is, after all, the policy of the democratically elected government. No, uh, you, 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 mis you misheard me. I said criminal justice policy is the policy of the democratically elected okay. government. Criminal justice policy yeah. is the policy of the democratically elected government. I had mistakenly thought that the policy of the democratically elected government was irrelevant and only became relevant when it was converted into law by parliament and that the independent prosecutor should in fact be independent of government policy can you clarify the um, every um, criminal justice system or, or at least every every criminal justice system that I've um, looked at has to uh, align or seeks to align prosecution policy in a general sense with criminal justice general criminal justice policy um, the prosecution of crime is um, uh, one of the means by which um, uh, 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 the criminal law is enforced, give it, give an effect, um, and um, it, it, 
it would be, I, I suspect, unacceptable for a variety of reasons if, prosecution, if, if decisions made in relation to the prosecution of crime cut radically against the um, criminal justice policy of the democratically elected parts of the government. And so it's entirely appropriate um, that um, prosecution policy and uh, uh, policies take into account where relevant um, general considerations of criminal justice. How that's done, the way it's done, the extent to which it's done is something which is uh, for me to determine in our system as the um, uh, Lord Advocate exercising my prosecutorial functions independently of any other person. So it's a question of relevance. Um, I, I regard the, the general criminal justice policy of government as relevant um, when I formulate prosecution policy. The relevance I attach to it is a matter for me. I think we have one other question at the back. Maybe two other questions, and maybe we will have to call it after that. So, question at the back, question here after. Right. Uh, Sheriff Frank Crow and uh, Apex board member. The Office of Lord Advocate is something of a super tanker that's been ploughing a course for the last 430 years. Uh, could you point to any change of priority or course since you took office about a year ago? Okay. <laughs> Um, well, I mentioned in my address the prosecution policy review which the, which, um, the service is undertaking. Um, that's uh, seeking in a more systematic way to give effect in our prosecution policies to the principle uh, which is in the prosecution code that um, uh, cases should be um, prosecuted in the lowest appropriate forum. We've sought to build an evidence base so that decisions are made uh, to apply that uh, principle in a, a more systematic way. Sorry, David Least from The Herald, Lord Advocate. How do you feel when you hear the Scottish justice system described as soft touch? Um, well, it, it, that seems to me to be a mischaracterization. Um, what what I've, I've sought to emphasize in my lecture is that we should be taking action which is effective, appropriate, proportionate. Um, that's not the same as soft touch. Um, Uh, John Forsyth. Um, Lord Advocate, I remember uh, in the immediate aftermath of last year's UK referendum on membership of the European Union that you expressed some concerns about what leaving the European Union and the associated prosecution and criminal justice networks might mean. I wonder a year on whether your concerns are greater or lesser or much the same. What do you think is at risk and do you have a plan B? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I have the same concerns as I expressed um, on that occasion. Um, we currently um, have the benefit in seeking to tackle cross-border crime of a variety of international instruments um, through the EU. Um, European Extradition Warrant, Eurojust, through, uh, which is an organization through which prosecutors cooperate with one another, European Investigation Order, um, uh, and the like, which facilitate cross-border cooperation in uh, addressing uh, criminality. And of course, these days, um, you know, crime does not stop at, uh, stop at our own borders. Um, so these are... Um, effective, valuable instruments in dealing with criminality. Um, at, at, at this point, we do not know what will replace them um, if we uh, 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 post-Brexit. Um, what I, uh, uh, and as a prosecutor, um, the Concern, you know, the, the obvious concern is that our ability to tackle cross-border criminality 
um, if we do not have those um, instruments in, in place, will be weakened. Uh, uh, um, matters have not really changed um, um, from that perspective since I spoke on this subject last year. Um, it remains to be seen uh, what, uh, will, what the position will be post-Brexit. Um, uh, all I can say from the perspective of the head of the prosecution system uh, is that um, uh, it would be uh, is that it is important that these uh, issues are given an appropriate level of priority um, by all all those who are uh, interested in uh, effectively dealing with cross-border criminality. Yeah, I'm trying to remember if I made a commitment to somebody at the back. If not, I'm going to wind up the questions. Yes, I'm going to wind them up uh, at this point. I'm going to ask uh, Alan's staff to close the event. I, I learned something tonight, and I'm grateful for David Strang easing me into professional prosecutorial judgment, which was once diversion. I think there's a whole conference on the difference between those. Um, when we launch our annual lecture, it's also the launch of our annual report. I know that you've seen the taster uh, notes in your welcome pack, and you'll barely be able to constrain yourselves getting home tonight to go www Apex Scotland. Anyway, I would like to ask our Chief Executive to close the event. Okay, well, I genuinely make the point of saying at this event that every year we try to identify a speaker and a topic which will not only bring something fresh and interesting to the justice debate, but which is going to inspire us all uh, who are committed to a modern and progressive approach to managing offending to continue that journey and to better understand the landscape within which we, under, which we operate. This year, I hope you'll agree that we have had in the Lord Advocate not only someone who is an expert in their field, but somebody who clearly has a sense of vision and purpose, uh, a sense of strategic direction, which complements, but is not controlled by, government policy and the justice sector. On the very day, of course, in which the First Minister laid out the intended programme of work uh, for the coming year, uh, and it was nice of her to uh, delay uh, the announcements to chime in with, with this lecture. Um, on this very day, we've seen numerous changes, and we've had the chance to hear, I believe, from one of the linchpins of the criminal justice machinery, which is going to be an integral part of that process. We are in the middle of a period of reform, we're in the middle of a period of, of debate, and we're in the middle of a period where we're, we're looking closely at what we do. Is Scotland genuinely different? And we genuinely have this sense of fairness. One of the things that I picked up in, uh, a lot in, in um, the, the lecture tonight, this concept of fairness and the needs for systems which are consistent with the objective of fairness. It's so important that we pick up on, on some of the issues that we, we heard today. And for me, as a uh, chief executive of a service provider and as somebody who is active within the third sector across the board in this field, it leads me to a number of conclusions, the things we've heard tonight. The first is that if we are to enable a progressive and fair prosecutorial system which actually can consider the relative merits of diversion or direct action or prosecution or, or, or sentencing uh, to imprisonment. If we're going to do that properly, we have to establish good evidence-based and effective alternatives because we cannot expect people to make decisions when what, they, what the alternative is there, they have no confidence in. So we need those alternatives, and those alternatives need to be credible. We need to build sustainability into those alternatives because there really is no point in setting up a, the best program in the world that disappears two years later because we only had a two-year funding cycle. That is not going to build confidence to anybody, and we cannot expect the prosecutors to feel that they have confidence in a system which is here today and gone tomorrow. And thirdly, we've heard of a, a bit of a disconnect 
between potentially between public opinion and justice policy and justice strategy. The disconnect between the need to punish, the need to protect, and maybe the need to think, well, how do we stop this happening? And I believe firmly that we need to, need to provoke a discourse which sees people keeping, keeping people out of the justice system as being a success, not getting people into it. So I would like to extend my thanks, and I'm sure this is echoed by all of those in the room, to the Lord Advocate for his lecture and for the full and frank way in which he responded to your questions. I know you'll join me now in expressing our appreciation of that. As always, I want to give my thanks to Lynn and her team for all the administration and event management, which makes this event such a success every year, and of course the staff and management of the Signet Library uh, for their professionalism and helpfulness, as well as the use of this wonderful venue. And of course my thanks to, to Brian for hosting the evening. I just have to uh, remind you that the video and transcript of this uh, lecture will be available on our website shortly. Finally. It's my very great pleasure to invite all of you who can join us in the area behind the screens here for a drinks reception. As you'll know from your packs, uh, we're 30 years old. I wish I was, no. <laughs> and to celebrate that, we've arranged for some displays of our work around the country, which I hope you'll take the opportunity to browse over and, and chat with our staff, um, because I think they're really proud of what they do, and we're proud of them. So. You know, they're, they're, some of them have come an awful long way. <laughs> so make a point of going and, and, and chatting about what they do. As we respond to the changing nature of the justice and community justice agenda, so we look to our new statement of intent and commit to aiming higher, behaving differently, and changing futures, not only as an approach to working with our clients, but also as a reflection of our own organisational culture. Please feel free to talk about what that means in reality. And as Brian has said, you can pick up a lot of it in the annual report, which is a special 30th anniversary edition. Really wonderful thing. So if you'd actually like to receive a hard copy of that in super duper Technicolor, then um, if you want to leave either a business card or your name and address at the uh, back of the room before you go tonight, we'll see that you get a hard copy free. Isn't that then So, you know, it was worth coming, wasn't it? Okay, so I think that we've even got some birthday cake available, so that uh, makes it all the more reason for you to come through. But if you cannot go, then uh, safe home to you. Good night, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you.